So Christian, where are you located? You're, you're not in the chem, you're not in the, the same complex as, as Bayat and Matias, et cetera, right? No, I'm at the, I'm at the other end of campus, but on the same campus. So it's about 500 meter walk or so. So you're on the Hungerberg campus. Yeah, yeah. But I, in fact, I rarely see Bayat. I don't know how much he's around. I haven't met uh, um, Sander yet. I was twice at his office, but he was not there. And I have most interactions with Gunnar Jeschke and Roland Riggs. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially Gunnar is kind of, yeah, we're, we're both working on bare bone instrumentation at that time, so. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad to know you're doing novel, right? Yeah, there is other things you want to try out with that, yeah. And there is pull, pull, Pulse Pole is another one. Uh, yes, but Paul Paul. is very good for us because we are at very low field. And we, have a lot of is... we have a lot of microwave power. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we don't we don't need too much. We don't need too much power and we have enough power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we may vary, we have to see. I mean it worked up to up to now, but we have to get better. <laughs> yeah. So we generally start at five after um, the academic five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll, oh, oh, people are here. So do you use a resonator at all? Or uh, no, no resonator. Uh, the, so we want to use just a coplanar waveguide. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we are very broadband. Um, so that we can go from zero to goal is 10 gigahertz. But then we have two transitions in the MV center, which is spin one. So ideally, we want to address both of them. And then one maybe at two gigahertz and the other one at five. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you're sometimes you upload even RF pulses to the same strip line. So it's one single broadband transfer. But why, why don't you go to higher field? Or, you know, uh, there is not really a big benefit. I mean, first, we have permanent magnets. Um, then we don't use Boltzmann. Um, spectral resolution is. Oh, well, you would have you would have <clears throat> you would have NMR shift resolution then. Yeah. yeah, that would be nice, but we are not at that resolution. Yeah. So we are at about hundred hertz. I mean that's that's <clears throat> that's the that's the reason to go to high field. This shift. Yeah. Resolution. I mean, maybe we could do a heroic experiment where we see NMR shift, but so far we haven't. I mean, you, you will see what the dominant interactions are. And I mean, we are solid state, so dipole is big and we don't have MAS. Mm -hmm. So chemical shift well, just there, has not there, there are a couple of things on your, on your agenda. Magic angle spinning and uh, high field. Yeah, yeah, we had some nice ideas, but... Uh, for example, take a nanodiamond with an MV center and an optical tweezer and rotate it. This is more kind of a... Well, we just... <coughs> we, the envelope idea. we just completed a, um, a new system. I mean, well, it's a few months old now, where we, yeah. we start with 10 gigahertz and multiply up to 60 mm -hmm. and mix in mm -hmm. the AWG. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and then we multiply by another four to get Pick it up to 250 gigahertz. Yeah. yeah, that's another low field means low frequency. Yeah, I mean, that is nice. <laughs> well, the 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 optical the, um, the microwave sources are are becoming quite. I mean, we have 220 milliwatts from a diode. Yeah, you know uh, now, which is you know substantial power. I mean, yeah. it used to be 20 milliwatts. Yeah, that you could get if you were at you know yeah. lower frequency. So. Maybe we're just afraid from high frequencies. We're not confident enough. Well, Xander Xander is building a 790 gigahertz gyrotron, so you should. Uh, yeah, I should go and see his lab space at some point. Well, I've, I've seen his space, but I haven't seen the instruments. Yeah.
Okay, a couple of more minutes and we'll get um, the ball rolling. Are you using diode sources or klystrons or what? Mm. For the microwaves? Yeah. You see, actually, I don't know. I mean, these are it's just synthesizers, either up to six or up to 20 gigahertz. So off the shelf um, test and measurement components. Uh -huh. Like on Schwartz or uh, Stanford mm. Research Systems. They go up that high right now. And then the AWGs have become very inexpensive. I mean, you can get a one gigahertz bandwidth for 6,000, maybe. Yeah, yeah, 6, uh, Trace Scientific. So everything now for us is digital, I mean, away from generators and then mix it with a single side yeah. bandwidth. Yeah. And even amplifiers at lower frequencies are, are quite affordable. OK, Kong, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Okay, I mean, like, I've, I've nothing too much to say, except that I, I just, uh, yeah, uh, welcome to our Zoomina session again, everyone. So like, um, I would just, I just copy and paste the usual thing that I, I do for every Zoomina sessions. So if this is your, your first time here, or if you're not familiar with this session, like, feel free to, so like, we have a mailing list, and also like, um, all, we also have a website, which, uh, which you can find all the past recordings, and yeah, so stay tuned, sign up to learn for our mailing list and we will have, uh, this series will continue to run at least until end of the year. And then we have the speakers already lined up uh, and what happens next year, we will see depending on the COVID situation. So yeah, Bob, feel free to introduce our speakers today. Okay, so today we have uh, <clears throat> two really excellent speakers, um, <clears throat> Christian Dagan uh, from the ETH in Zurich and he's going to be telling us about uh, NV centers and the NMR and EPR of uh, single spins. And then the second talk uh, is Phil Grandinetti from Ohio State University. And Phil has an exciting new magnetic resonance simulator program uh, for solid state NMR spectral simulation and analysis. Um, so Christian, um, of course, was a PhD student at the ETH. He was a postdoc with Dan Rugar at IBM uh, <clears throat> in Almadine, uh, California. And then he was at MIT for a short time uh, until the ETH offered him a position and he moved back to uh, the physics department at the ETH where he's currently a full professor of physics. And uh, his title of his talk today is Single Spin NMR and EPR uh, Using NV Centers and Diamond. So Christian, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bob, and thanks, uh, Gong, also for the invitation. I assume you can hear everything okay, so it's fine. Yeah, otherwise interrupt. Um, yeah, so welcome for joining. And I guess my goal today is to take you a little bit out of the comfort zone towards exotic, what's ever in the exotic session at the ENC. In this case, uh, experiments we're trying to do on single spins in diamond, uh, electron spins you form from ND centers, and then also how we can use those to detect single and then multiple nuclear spins with a goal of imaging. Um, so let me give you the grand motivation. Um, the grand goal is whether we can take a molecule, it's been a long-term goal, uh, put it down somewhere and image the nuclei in the molecule in 3D. So if you could do this, you would have a microscope that can do MRI at the atomic scale. Um, of course, this is very challenging. I don't know whether we'll ever reach it, but it's turned out to be a very nice test bed for all sorts of physical experiments at the atomic scale. Um, so the goal would be that you find the 3D atomic positions. So this calls for 3D distance measurements, and then that you can uh, do an ele elemental identity. So identify individual nuclei. So this is the ideal situation. How are we going to try and attack this? And there are several ways towards this. And the one I'm showing today is uh, what we call the diamond platform. And the generic idea is that we take a, a very pure diamond crystal, which has a purposely engineered electron spin right below the surface, a nitrogen vacancy center. And then that we use this single electron spin, which we can read out optically. So we can detect a single spin by optically detected magnetic resonance. 
um, to sense through the surface uh, the spins in the molecule. So this is kind of the experimental sketch on um, what we would want to do on the long term. And what we would aim for is detecting precession, not polarization. So again, we can't do this. We have taken some steps in various directions. And I'm going to mainly show you one experiment and then in the very end, how we try to move to outside molecules. So this is our toy system right now. Um, it, oftentimes, we have two types of nuclei. One of them, uh, which I'm using mostly today, are the carbon-13 in the diamond lattice. They're there at 1% abundance. Uh, and they're very neat because they're isolated. and They're very useful as a test bed for testing this idea of 3D distance measurements. Um, we can, at times, detect spins on the surface. Those mostly are films. So we detect a bulk type NMR signal from protons or also fluorine of a molecular layer uh, at the surface. So again, moving on, what I'm mostly going to focus on today, except for the last few slides uh, look in an outlook, uh, are the C13 spins. And if you take this picture and make it even more general, uh, what we're trying to do now in the following is take a central single electron spin and uh, see whether we can detect single nuclear spins. So first one of them, and then several of them, and ultimately also whether we can detect couplings between them. Um, so to give you some numbers where we operate, uh, we're in an exotic regime at very low field. So we tend to operate between zero and 200 millitesla using permanent magnets. And if you convert this to Hertz numbers, our electron spin is at a few gigahertz frequency. The nuclear spins, carbon-13, around a few megahertz. Uh, and then the couplings we'll be looking for, these are hyperfine dipole interactions, or one to tens of kilohertz. Um, there are also couplings between the C13, as you will see. Uh, we can hardly measure them. We can if you want to, but they're below 100 hertz typically. So they're not going to be important for uh, the measurements uh, I'm going to show you in the following. Um, good. So. How I uh, will we proceed? I'm first going to show you how we measure a single electron spin, the NV center. Uh, once we can do this, I'm going to move forward to show you how we can measure one nuclear spin. And this is actually an interesting experiment from a physics perspective. And then I'm going to ex uh, expand this to many nuclear spins, but still being able to see all of them individually and uh, trying to do distance mapping. And then, uh, time permitting, I'm going to give you a short outlook on how to move to outside spins. Uh, if you like the topic, I put two references below, which is more or less what's covered in the presentation. Um, good. So what is this NV center or more generally defect centers in semiconductors and ice insulators? Um, so if you have a crystal lattice, it often has defects. Uh, and many of those defects uh, are either optically active, so they cause the color in diamond shown to the left. So these are all and diamond crystals, some of them are very pure, the gray one, and then the yellow one has a lot of nitrogen. So these are at atomic defects. Uh, diamond has hundreds of defects, and this is why it has so many colors. Um, then some of those defects are also magnetic, meaning you can detect them by EPR. And the one which many people focus on nowadays is shown to the right in this rotating lattice. It's called the NV center because it is a double defect. Uh, uh, consisting of a nitrogen on a vacant site. So it uses the electrons from the nitrogen and the dangling bonds from the carbon surrounding the vacancy. Um, so it's sometimes called a molecular ion because what we study is a, an NV minus, a negatively charged defect. And the interaction of this defect with the lattice is quite small. So if you draw an energy level uh, diagram, so like atomic. Uh, diagram, it looks like a single molecule, so a molecular ion uh, trapped in a solid. So we can perform on a solid molecule uh, uh, atomic physics and NMR experiments. So below are a few important points. There are more of them, but these are the key ones for you. So uh, the enemy center has an electron spin one, um, so it's magnetic. Then it's a single emitter, meaning we can detect it using confocal fluorescence microscopy, like in single molecule experiments. Uh, and it has a, it's very protected. So it has very long coherence and, and T1 times for an electron speed. So I put down some numbers. Uh, they can vary for defects, especially if they're close to the surface. 
uh, but they're more reminiscent of nuclear spins than of electron spins. So sometimes we say the NV center is actually a nuclear spin with a very high gamma, uh, also experimentally. Uh, it, it rather looks like a nuclear spin. Um, it is spin one, so it has a zero field splitting, um, like a quadrupole for nuclei. Um, so where are those NV centers present? They're present in most crystals unless they're ex ex extremely pure. In our case, we make them by on purpose. So we buy those synthetic crystals from a company in the UK. Uh, then we implant nitrogen at very low energy such that they stop a few nanometers below the surface. So then they have nitrogen below the surface at a defined depth. Uh, and then you do an annealing process to form this molecule of a, with a vacancy. Um, nowadays, we shape those crystals, so we don't use them as plates, uh, but we make uh, pillars, and these pillars are most of all photonic waveguides, so they allow us to extract light more efficiently. Because in the end, our SNR, which is always low, uh, is given by how many photons we can detect in an optical microscope. So this is our uh, coil, so to say. Um, so we want to get as many photons as possible, and this is quite hard for diamond, which has a high refractive index. Uh, we also do uh, scanning probe microscopy experiments. I'm not going to show this today, but this is just an image of a scanning probe. So you see the tip below here with an NV center, center at the end that we then scan over magnetic surfaces to do uh, material science experiments. Um, how do you measure and how is the setup uh, looking like for these uh, experiments? It's actually quite simple if you're familiar with optics. So all you need is a laser diode. Uh, that you then shine through a your common microscope objective onto your diamond. The diamond is on a stage that can move around such that it can focus on different portions of the sample. And then there is red light emitted. So the NV center has a purple coloring, meaning it absorbs green light and it emits red light. And then this red emission is what is collected by a sensitive photo detector. Uh, in our case, we use an avalanche photodiode, so we count single photons. Um, and the key information is encoded in the intensity of the, the photons. Um, uh, more precisely, if the NV center is in the MS equals zero state, uh, we sometimes call it the non-magnetic state, then there is a higher photon count uh, uh, compared to when it's in the plus minus one uh, MS state. So in this way, we can determine which spin state uh, the NV center is in by looking at high or low um, intensity in the optical uh, photoluminescence. Um, then to EPR, we apply microwaves. So we have a small strip line antenna that is uh, close to the diamond. And uh, if you look at this diamond, and I'm now showing one of those scanning tips looking down from the top, uh, the pillar or look similar. Uh, then you see the image to the right. So the top is just an electron micrograph showing this same paddle that you see here from the top. So the diamond tip is below my red laser pointer here. And below is an optical image, fluorescence image, and you see this bright spot in the center, which is this pillar, which has an NV center at the end. So for experiments, we park our laser spot at this location, and then we collect photons from the NV center that's on the opposite side of the diamond. Um, okay, then just an image of the setup. This is, looks slightly different, but uh, it's uh, always working in a similar principle. The objective is below here. There's green light impinging on a bigger piece of diamond here, a few millimeters in size. There is this micro, uh, microscope cover slip, which is gold coated and has a transmission line in the center. So we pass microwaves, uh, very broadband through this strip line to do EPR. Um, what else? We sometimes have a, an RF micro coil mounted to do any more experiments. This is not shown uh, here. It's uh, uh, just an image to the left, uh, which we mount as we really measure. Otherwise, you wouldn't see the setup here. And then we always have a magnet present uh, to do the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is small. We can use permanent magnets. Uh, we have to make them temperature compensated to have less drift, but uh, a few hundred millitesla are sufficient. Um, and the reason is why, why you can use you, low field is that we don't need to polarize uh, Boltzmann. We do this either by optical polarization or DMP. And uh, the chemical shifts uh, so far is not a big resource maybe yet for us. Um, so how does the experiment work? Uh, and I'm showing this as a like a pulse diagram to compare this to your traditional NMR, to traditional NMR experiments or EPR. 
Um, we don't use Boltzmann polarization, but we use optical pumping. So it turns out if you apply this green laser, you optically pump the NV center into a zero state with 70 to 90% uh, polarization. So within one microseconds, we can fully polarize the electron spin, which would otherwise take uh, minutes or hours, uh, or seconds to minutes uh, to uh, reach a thermal polarization. Um, uh, then we apply microwave pulses. The experiment shown here will be a RAMSI or FID experiment. And then the other key element is we don't detect transverse uh, precession inductively, but we measure polarization. So we have to do an indirect experiment to, de to detect an FID. That means we apply this pulse, it evolves for some time, and then we sample one point by converting the uh, precession back to polarization uh, using a second green laser pulse, which we call a readout, where we measure the fluorescence intensity. And at this point, we turn the photodetector on. So the result will be a number of photons measured. And if the number is high, we were in a one state, a zero state. And if the number of photons is low, you're in the minus one or plus one state. So here's an experiment just as an illustration. Uh, the T2 here, T2 star is a few microseconds. We detect polarization and we have to average many times. So each data point uh, has about 10 to the five to 10 to the six averages to have enough photons. Um, but because it goes so fast, so this whole sequence takes only a couple of microseconds, we can average very fast. Okay, so this is how we detect one electron spin. So let's move on to the second point, which is how we can we try and measure nuclear spins. And this actually is an interesting experiment from a, a basic physics per perspective, because uh, you can ask yourself that you have a nuclear spin processing, you're trying to observe the precession now, while I'm watching this spin processing, will I influence it or not? Or more quantum mechanically, I mean, do I have back action as I watch my quantum state processing in the plane? Um, and this goes back here to a, a proposal experiment by John Seidels, where you could use an inductive coil. You have your observed spin, and you need a detector that somehow uh, can measure your, your uh, spin without disturbing it. And you know the uh, um, feature of radiation damping. You could imagine doing this on a single spin level and being affected by something similar to radiation damping. So our scheme here is that we have a nuclear spin, we bring it close to an electronic spin, and then we try to use the electron spin to detect the processing nuclear spin. Um, how do we do this? Um, this comes in three levels. I'm starting with the basic level. Um, we have the nuclear spins. We need to polarize them somehow. We start with one spin. Then we want to manipulate it, meaning we just apply a, a, a pi half pulse with the external coil, and then we watch the pre-induction decay. So we detect. Um, this looks quite different uh, for our scheme. So to polarize, we can't use Boltzmann, but we want to use the electron spin. So the idea is to optically polarize the electron spin, transfer polarization to the nuclear spin uh, using novel. Uh, apply the pi half pulse as usual, and then we need some sequence to measure the nuclear precession. And here I won't go into big detail, but what we do is that we uh, make a periodic readout of the electron spin uh, while we apply a CPMG or a multi-pulse decoupling sequence. So if we apply a CPMG G sequence, and this one is exactly in sync with the nuclear precession, we will see that this decoupling fails. If the CPMG sequence is not synchronized with the nuclear precession, everything works as usual. There is good decoupling. The nuclear spin is not detected. So we detect as, as our meter for the presence of a nuclear spin, uh, a failure or a decoherence uh, of the electron spin during the CPMG sequence. And we can do this not only once, but in a whole series. And what it turns out is if you do this many times, uh, uh, sampled at some interval, we get a direct measure of the nuclear free induction decay. Um, so this is the advanced version for the experts. I'm including here the expert version, which you can, I guess, look at later on in full detail, showing you everything from an uh, amplitude ramp novel, polarization of the intrinsic uh, N15 nuclear spins, uh, repeated many times, and then the whole uh, block that you need to polarize TNV, apply the CPMG to detect the nuclear precession, and then read it out. Uh, read it out again using a photo detector. Um, good. So what do you expect as an experiment? And I'm, I'm going to jump to and just show you what the result is as expected, uh, a free induction decay. 
And so what you see here is now the readout index. So each index is one block or one FID point averaged many times uh, for some what we call contact time or this is the duration of the CPMC G sequence which can be short or long. Um, here is an intermediate value and you see we see a FID decay of the nuclear spin. The duration here equivalent is about a millisecond and we see decays. So we have a decaying FID, we can Fourier transform it and getting a spectrum. So now the interesting part comes in, what happens if we change this contact time, meaning the electron spin is coupled shorter or longer to the nuclear spin? Will this have an effect on the nuclear spin itself? So one thing we can do is reduce this contact time. So we have the electron coupled to the nuclear spin uh, less for a shorter time, meaning less strongly. And what you see is that we have less signal, the oscillation is less high, but it persists longer. So it means we are detecting less effectively. Our detector is not as good anymore, but we don't disturb the nuclear spin as much because, I mean, there is decay here, there is no decay here. So I'm going to make the point that the decay here, here is actually radiation damping or more generally back action. You can go the short way and you get even less influence. Spectrum is very narrow, but the peak is small. You can also go the other way. The signal increases, but now the decay is faster. And if we increase this even more and more, we get very large signal, but the signal decays extremely rapidly. So what the gist is here that I can take a detector, I can measure the nuclear spin very strongly, but then my precession is killed within a few uh, cycles. I can measure very weakly, I, get not, I don't get much signal, uh, but the nuclear precession is hardly perturbed if the spin just keeps precessing. And there is an optimum, as you can see in the middle here somewhere, where I have a good balance between some Defacing of the nuclear spin, some decoherence of the nuclear spin, but still adequate signal. Okay, so this is the exciting part for physics that you have this back action and you can find an optimum between weak and strong measurement. So let me now move on to many nuclear spins. Uh, you can also apply this to a number of nuclear spins, and usually you have many nuclear spins because we're in diamond, there are C13s around, and if you measure Sensitively enough, uh, you always detect a couple of them that surround your ME center. So this is how the uh, FID looks like if you have many nuclear spins. You can do a, a power spectrum. Uh, now you see a nice NMR spectrum with peaks, most of them corresponding to single nuclei being closer or more distant from our central electronic spin. Um, so I'm gonna interpret this in a second, but now what we wanna do is that we take our electron spin we see as our astronomer here, stars spins in the sky and we wanna know how far away or how close they are and also on what direction they're lying. And if we can do this, you would have a 3D telescope, so to say for nuclei. And it turns out you can do this at least for single spins. And uh, before I show you the trick, I'm just gonna give you the more qualitative answer of what is what. So what happens if you have a very close nuclear spin then you will have a large hyperfine shift. So you're shifted far away from this natural C13 line width as you would expect from the external field. But you have a very broad line because we measure even quite strongly, we are strongly coupled. Um, then you have an optimum distance. Uh, that would be the middle of our series from before. You have four C13s with weak signal, but, uh, but now there are uh, uh, narrow peaks. Um, there are many C13s even further away that we can't spectrally resolve. We call them the very far back. Um, so we have the whole spectrum of distant and close spins. So this is the qualitative view. Uh, so let's now turn to the quantitative analysis. And this relies all on the dipolar interaction. And uh, this is the part that you will uh, know well. Um, how can we uh, analyze this in terms of uh, NMR couplings? We have two components that are important. And we call them the parallel or transverse hyperfine coupling parameter which would be the secular or non-secular part of the dipolar coupling. And we can measure both couplings individually, and they give us a number for the radius R here and the polar angle theta. Um, and they're encoded, if you go back here, in the peak height, which is the non-secular term, and the distance from the central line, which would be the secular term. Um, so we have two components, meaning 2D. And if you want to have a 3D measurement, we also need the azimuth here. And the ter it turns out there's a neat way to do this. And the way to do this is that we have a microcoil, which is a common laboratory frame axis to initiate precession. 
However, the hyperfine field has a different or a phi, ang uh, phi angle, azimuth angle for each nuclear spin. So if you measure the FID, all FIDs will be at a different phase. And this phase is directly this spatial laboratory frame phase between the hyperfine coupling and our common frame of reference given by the, the microcoil uh, from the setup. So this means we have all three polar angles and we can do 3D distance mapping. Um, this is where it becomes quite nasty. So we have this spectrum here and we have somehow from the spectrum to extract many, many different uh, nuclear coordinates. Let's say you have 20 spins, three coordinates means 60 unknowns. And this works uh, less good or better uh, depending on which nuclei you're actually having. So how are we doing this? We take the spectrum, we don't look at the power spectrum anymore, but at the complex spectrum, which you see has in-phase and out-of-phase terms, which is this phi angle. And to be more redundant, we take a number of spectra for different contact times shown up here. So here we measure most strongly, which would be more distant spins. Here we measure more weakly, which would be closer spins. So we have now a big data set that we can feed into a, a gigantic maximum high likelihood estimation. So you need a, a computer cluster, which then tries to minimize uh, the maximum likelihood what the positions are. Um, if you want to know the details, I'm happy to follow up at a later time. I'm just going to show you the result here. We find, first of all, that we can fit about 29 spins into the spectrum. If you have more, it's overfitting. Uh, and we can start localizing them, including error bars. So here is distance, radial distance from the NB, which would be sitting at 0, 0, and the Z distance, and the numbers are nanometers. So you see all spins labeled here. Uh, you can also plot them in a polar plot um, or in a 3D way. So this will be your te 3D telescope showing you where the stars are. Uh, this is one example. Here's just another example from another data set. And you see some spins are very well localized and the ones with the big error region here are not very well localized. So what in essence it shows that you can do 3D distance measurement and spatial mapping of nuclei uh, within the diamond. Um, so just to conclude, where do we want to move from here? We had this dream picture of outside molecules. And uh, the question is whether this is feasible or not. And actually, I would put it differently. The question is, how useful will it be? Because I think uh, the numbers are there that it can be done on outside nuclear spins. But the question is, will it be useful, let's say, for uh, measuring the 3D structure of a molecule? So I'm going to stick to the first part, which is the physics part. Can we do it or not? And also what steps need to be taken or uh, that we are working on now. Um, so here's our sketch on what you want to do when you move to outside molecules. You have still have your NV center. You want to move it as close to the surface as possible. And then you want to have some isolated molecules that you can couple to individually. And uh, we also want to look at the internal structure of the molecules. So what we're working on now is, first of all, that we have NV centers that are very stable, uh, a few nanometers below the surface. So our record here is, I would say, 3.5 nanometers for a decent T2. But this uh, takes a lot of effort in materials engineering. Uh, another thread is that we work on uh, surface chemistry, just to protect the diamond surface and also to attach molecules. Uh, again, there are multiple ways. Um, then from the NMR perspective, we need to learn how to polarize molecules outside here. So what we've learned to do is to polarize, to transfer polarization from the NV outside and read it back. But we need to get more efficient. So we need to work on our novel or other sequence. And then we want to use 2D NMR to also look at the couplings inside a molecule, which will be at least of the order of our hyperfine interaction here. And lastly, we want to have a surface chemistry that gives us isolated molecules. So I'm going to conclude with a big slide, just showing you some possible avenues that we could go. Uh, one of them is shown to the right, uh, starting right, is that you could try and measure a 3D structure of a molecule, but this would be more a, uh, of a demonstration experiment or a hero experiment. Uh, we have seen influences of changing surface chemistry. So you could think of monitoring at the molecular level, single molecule level, uh, whether the surface chemistry changes. Uh, a big effort in our community is that we use it as a test bed for uh, quantum science using nuclear spins as quantum resources. And then we have a postdoc that recently started uh, exploring whether you could measure, measure chirality of molecules, of single molecules using the surface anymore. So, with this, I would like to um, acknowledge my group and thank you for your attention.
Okay, thank you very much, Christian, for your very, very interesting talk. As, as Christian said in the beginning, this is something, this should be in the exotica session. And in fact, I think like a lot of people like show up today, to today, like relative to the previous session, because I think um, we want to have some something exotica. <laughs> yes. Um, so like, I would like to remind the participants, if you have any questions, feel free to use the, the Q&A um, functions that you can see at the bottom of your Zoom window. So type your questions there instead of uh, in the chat room so that uh, everyone can see it or comment and, and yeah. Yes, uh, so like, I will just keep, uh, let the participants have a little bit of time to type in their questions. Maybe I, I will start by some, uh, some, some, some personal uh, uh, questions or, or some, 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 something that I, I, uh, something I want to ask. Uh, so I, I talked to several people in the uh, Anime Diamond uh, uh, from, from this community. So I, I've heard that they say that, um, I'm not sure if this is true or so you can, you can, uh, you can comment on it. So they say that the OD NMR sense, how, do, how would you compare the OD NMR sensitivity with uh, induction-based detected method? I mean, this is something we, uh, in NMR community that we always do. So but I've, I've heard that the induction base is mm -hmm. much more sensitive than OD NMR. So yeah. can you comment on that? And if that's the case, then what's the advantage, yeah. advantage that yes or offer? Yeah, so this is a very good question. So it goes back to the use of diamond. So, I've shown here experiments with single and mesenergy in diamond, which is at the atomic scale. So there's nowhere you're going to do it an inductive NMR here. However, there is another branch of efforts in NV centers that use um, bulk crystals with many, many NV centers. So millions, billions on a micron scale and use this more in traditional sense as an NMR detector. So uh, for example, for microfluidics. And as far as I know, the uh, sensitivities there are similar to uh, what you can do with inductive NMR. So you will replace your micro coil with a, a micron, tens of micron sized doped diamond crystal. Um, and then again, it really depends on what your, uh, uh, what you want to do later on. I mean, you, we work mostly at low field. It's quite hard to shake any centers to high field because of the high frequencies. Um, so there, there are practical uh, considerations that also will come into play, how you polarize your sample and so on. But I would say, I think they're kind of similar, uh, but then it depends on the detail. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. So because yeah, this also answer my, uh, my second question, because like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so what, uh, what, what you do now is you align your micro coil and this is on a single crystal sample. Yeah. Right? So we have a micro coil simply for applying broadband uh, RF pulses. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the micro coil is not tuned. It's a bandwidth of 20 megahertz. I mean, this little micro coil that appeared on the bottom left. And it's solely here to do any more pulsing. It's only transmit, it's not detect. Yeah. Would, would, you, would, you, would you extend this method to a powder sample? Um, In the future? So the oh. Powder sample or powder diamond? <laughs> powder diamonds, yes. Powder diamonds, yes. Um, okay. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so one answer is the NV center. So it's a spin one. So it has a, a, a crystal anisotropy. So it's very sensitive on direction. So one difficulty of using with powdered uh, unstructured diamond is that your anisotropy axis, your zero field is pointing in all different directions, which makes it quite cumbersome. So it's not as easy to just apply a high field. Um, that said, people have explored at least using nano diamonds with NV centers let's say in biological cells to try and do magnetic resonance experiments in, in, a, in cells, for example. Um, and then I think there were efforts of doing, trying to do DNP. So use NV centers as resources that you can optically polarize and then do DNP. But I think this has not been very successful because uh, it's very hard to get the DNP out of the NV center through the diamond surface and into a sample. So maybe some words to powers. Um, okay, okay, good, good. Because this is something that the animal community will be very interested in, as everyone knows, <laughs> the yeah. whole degree. Yep, uh, so I will just uh, go through the first question in Q&A. So Jeff Primer, he says, beautiful work, Christian. A brief question. What are the primary mechanisms for lengthening T2 at the surface? Okay, so thank you. Yet another very good point. So T2 of NV, if you're deep in diamonds, can be 100 microseconds, maybe a millisecond. Um, if you come close to the surface, this value goes down. And the reason is that you have radicals on the surface. 
and sometimes also electric fields because uh, electric fields can also decode the NE. So now if you want to have still uh, keep the longitude near the surface, so near means a few nanometers, you have to work on your surface. And the, the uh, practical advance is you need as clean as possible, as flat as possible surface that you can get. So we developed recipes for cleaning and uh, the, the diamond surface getting rid of every SD2 carbon to have as few radicals and as smooth topography as you can. And this in general makes the T2, um, in increases T2. So you need a clean diamond surface. And this is tough because diamond is a tough material. Okay, uh, Jeffrey just raised his hand and hi, Jeffrey, you can, you can talk, you can ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. you can. Yes, I was excited. It was a very nice lecture, by the way. Thank um, you. Very clear and transparent. But of course, there's something that puzzled me. You spoke about 2D NMR. I, I can see that it would be fairly easy to add another pulse in your, what you call the Ramsey sequence. Mm -hmm. But if you have no chemical shift dispersion, uh, and I don't think you have enough dispersion at such low field and probably very inhomogeneous fields. Um, yeah. What is it going to help? What is it going to tell you to do 2D? Or do you have in mind to do some heteronuclear 2D where you could maybe go from protons to carbon and back to protons or something like that? So uh, both of them, but maybe to the first part, what we have tried doing is, can we see couplings between individual C13s inside the diamond? And the method we used is so-called J spectroscopy. Okay. And then what gives you the chemical shift resolution is actually the hyperfine interaction of the C13 with the NV center. And then to get the cross terms in the, the cross peaks in the 2D NMR, this is the C13, C13 dipolar interaction. So in this particular example, we replace the chemical shift with uh, the hyperfine interaction to the uh, and we, and we center. But yes, looking forward, we have to see in the end what works best. And I think heteronuclear will, will be an important part. Okay, thank you. But if you can detect single spins, then uh, I mean, the chemical shift becomes less important. So <clears throat> you could um, C13 enrich your diamond, all right? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and that would, that would, Partially offset Jeff, or partially answer Jeffrey's question, if you if you did that, yeah, you would. Uh, <clears throat> but if you go back to your spectra uh, of the, the, it looks like the diamond. Is, I mean, you had something right there, yeah. No, so that looks a little bit like an indoor spectrum, um, where you have a bulk resonance in the center, and then <clears throat> you have uh, other resonances off, but they're not really symmetric, uh, which is what you would expect from an indoor, uh, at least a high field indoor spectrum. So here they're not symmetric because you're hyperfine. Um, the secular term can be positive or negative. So uh, if, you, no. and if you have a 90 degree location, then it's negative. If it's uh, axial, then it's positive. This is what, what shifts the resonances to higher or lower frequency. Okay, yeah. All right, and your other spectra, if you looked at the, the ones, the, the series of spectra that you showed, they also look, uh, yeah, those, <clears throat> those are, now how are you detecting, how are you doing your quadrature detection here? We're just phase shifting the laser light by 90 degrees? Um, no, we use, so it's an indirect sampling of the effort, we use TPPI. Uh, so we phase shift, like every readout, in our quantum readout uh, has is phase sensitive to the precession and we shift the phase by 90 degrees between each readout and then just in the Fourier transform it upshifts it such we have both keep both components but it will be the same as TPPI in indirect NMR. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, are there other questions from Jeffrey from Jeff or from anyone else before we move on to the next presentation. Okay. Okay. Maybe, well, I, maybe I just asked another simple one. Can, can you elaborate a bit more when you say that when you try to synchronize your CPMG with the NMR detection, you, you it doesn't work? So like was it just broad or noisy or or, or 
Yeah. You mean when I synchronize or don't synchronize? When you synchronize, you say when you synchronize it, it doesn't work. Um, no, I have to synchronize it. So I'll, I'll call up another slide. It's not complete. Um, so this is now a zoom in on one of those blocks labeled purple blocks labeled one, two, three K. Um, so we use a green laser pulse to polarize the NV center. We apply the CPMG sequence. And this is a very good decoupling, decoupling sequence. So in a normal case, we just completely co keep the um, coherence of the NV center. And we, at the end, have the full polarization still available. Now, if there is a nuclear spin present, which uh, processes at exactly the periodicity of those pulses, uh, so uh, I would need to draw into the diagram here, but it would start uh, at the first pi pulse, you're going up in a sine fashion, then it would cross again, go negative, it goes up again. Uh, then it turns out we have like, it would be like a rotational resonance. So your decoupling for this magic uh, frequency doesn't work anymore. So it turns out you don't get the full polarization at the end, and the deviation is exactly the signal you're looking for. Mm, okay. so it's kind of a failed decoupling that we're looking for. But I think rotational it's, resonance in, in MIS may be a, a good. Component. Yeah, I, I was, when you say this, it, it sounds like re recoupling to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a recoupling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's thank, thank Christian you. for a really uh, <clears throat> nice presentation. And our second speaker today um, is Phil Grandinetti from Ohio State University. Uh, Phil was a uh, <clears throat> undergraduate in West Virginia, I think, something like that, right? Yes. With, uh, Maurice Delal. He did his PhD with Jerry Jonas at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And then he was a postdoc with Alex Pines at UC Berkeley uh, before he took his present position at Ohio State University. And Phil is going to tell us today is about his latest and greatest results with his MR simulator uh, to simulate NMR, uh, solid state NMR spectra uh, for simulation and analysis. Okay. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you. And, and thank you, Bob, and thank you, Kong, for giving me this opportunity. I'm really uh, grateful to, to be here and share with you some of the work that we're doing. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, a, a package that we've written for Python, and I'll give you sort of our motivations for that here as I get into the talk, that for, for doing solid NMR simulations. And I'll just sort of start out by saying that this is work that's funded uh, with uh, from NSF, from CMI, DMR, and also in a DIBS grant that's uh, led by Kristen Pearson and also involves uh, uh, Sophia Hayes. So let me uh, first actually do a little advertisement. So just let everyone know that we have at Ohio State the, the National Gateway high, Ultra High Field NMR Center, and uh, we have quite a, quite a, uh, selection of different types of spectrometers for liquids and for solids down here. And just to let everyone know that coming soon, probably, uh, hopefully by next summer, we'll be having the 1.2 gigahertz, which will be delivered. And this is a little cartoon here, actually, where we've dropped in a picture of the 1.2 in the middle of our NMR facility here. So you can check out the, the link down here if you want to learn more about the facility and how you can be, become a user there. Okay, before I get too far into my talk, I want to first thank the, to let you know that the people who behind all this, this work, and this is really the brainchild of Dipan Srivastava, who's uh, a postdoc and former graduate student in my group, and who's now at Hyperfine, and also working on this project was Max uh, Venatos, who is uh, an undergrad working on this project, but now is at UC Berkeley working with Kristen Pearson, and also, uh, Working on the project was Lexi McCarthy, a graduate student in the group, and Matthew Jamar, who's also an undergrad working on the group. And this is our summer right after we all got vaccinated and we were all happy to enjoy some time together. So you're probably all wondering, okay, do we need another solid state NMR package or some NMR simulation package? And, and let me give you some of our motivations for why we wanted to do this. And Probably the primary one is that you know, there's a, a new sort of software paradigm that's out there in terms of the way we, we're bringing packages together to build software that's greater than the, the sum of the parts. 
And so what we wanted to do is we want to build a package that was easily shared with other libraries, particularly if you're interested in a lot of machine learning type code and you want to have a, a package that's able to do NMR simulations and you can integrate into whatever other type of work you're trying to do. And one of the challenges is, of course, you know, a lot of the, the previous code that we, we, we know and love has been developed sort of, you know, years ago, and they're much more monolithic, and it's a lot harder to sort of connect them to the sort of modern data science tools. We also wanted to make sure that we wrote a library that was easy to use by non-NMR specialists, so they didn't have to get into the, the, the gory details of what's going on in the simulation. Now, we thought about this, and we, we wanted to have a simulation package that was would somehow capture the versatility of what you would have in a sort of time domain density operator calculation, you know, where you, you could dream up whatever sequence you want, you could run the Simpson or, or spinach and you could enter that sequence and you can get the output of that and be able to simulate your spectrum. But that can be actually a pretty difficult process. You have a lot of steep learning curve to get into that. And on the other side of that is sort of just using a program like DM fit, for example, if you just want to fit a spectrum and that's a frequency domain simulation. And that's been a very powerful tool for everyone in the community for a long time. What we wanted to do was to try to develop a package that was sort of somewhere in between this. We wanted to have the speed of these frequency domain uh, packages, but we, but we also wanted to have the versatility that you have in sort of a full blown uh, density matrix simulation. But we didn't want to go all the way to a full quantum mechanical simulation like a density operator. But what we wanted to capture was the ability to sort of have a new experiment that you dreamed up and to be able to code that into MR simulator so that you can simulate that spectrum right away without waiting for somebody to say, implement that as one of the standard you know, line shapes that you would have in one of these other packages. So that was sort of our three main goals here in trying to develop this package. Now we developed this in Python and, and, and unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last few years, you know that Python has sort of become the language for sort of machine learning and all types of other exciting activities. And you know, so the motivations are pretty clear. It's free, it's open source, it's portable. You can even run Python in a web browser on a hosted Jupyter notebook service. It's object oriented. It's really easy to learn. I, I like to think of it as like, you know, the basic of the 21st century, if you guys remember learning basic in the, in the 80s. Um, and it's also, you know, much more powerful, of course, than, than basic ever was. Uh, the packages are really easy to install. So you don't have to sort of hunt down and try to figure out how to install things. It's supported on all the different platforms. Uh, it's got a very large global community that are developing libraries that we can all leverage and, and together with our own apps. Uh, so for example, Scikit-Learn has become like the standard uh, app, a uh, standard package for machine learning and data science. And the other cool thing is that you can develop progressive web apps uh, based on these type of packages. That makes it kind of useful. So you may be wondering, okay, how do I get started with Python uh, and NMR simulator? I don't know anything about Python. Well, the easiest way probably to get started is just go to Google's uh, Colab site. So colab.google.com, log in with your Google email address and you have the whole environment all set up and ready to go. And you can just start typing in and executing the commands, even the stuff that I'm showing you here today. If you wanted to run it locally on your own computer and still run it in a web browser, you can do that by just sort of downloading Anaconda, which is a nice uh, package that will give you an environment. And if, you, if you're in a really, if you like this and you think it's useful, maybe you might want to uh, have me come to your Zoom meeting. I'm happy to tell you more about the details of how it works. Okay, so let me just get into the details of how you might use MR Simulator. So start out, you would just simply go to a terminal. If you have Python already installed, you would just type pip install MR Simulator and you have the package are already there. If you were in Google Colab and you're in a notebook, you would start out with exclamation point, which is a little trick to get you into a command line. And then you would type pip install MR simulator and you would have it installed. Now, one note here is Google Colab needs to update their NumPy library. So you have to do this line here first to update NumPy first. So, but that's a minor thing. Okay, so here's an example of one script. I'm just gonna go through this line by line, well, not line by line, but section by section to show you how you could use MR simulator and how easy it is. So, and we see in this first few lines here, this is a comment up here, 
we're just defining sites coupling and spin system. We're gonna grab these objects, the site object, the coupling object, and the spin system object. And then with the site object, we're just gonna create a carbon site. You can see the arguments that we put, have to put in are pretty obvious to everyone. If you're in NMR field, you understand what's going on here. If you create a, a proton site, you just create the proton site. If you don't put in the parameters, it just defaults to zero for all those parameters. So in other words, we're putting in a proton site with an isotropic chemical shift of zero. Then we create a coupling between the sites. We give it the index. So we're saying between zero and one. And then we put in a dipolar coupling constant. We create our sites and we put them into our spin system. So we say our spin system has a bunch of sites. It has this coupling and we've created a spin system object. So that's it. That's You can imagine sort of extrapolating from this how you could build more complicated spin systems this way. The next step is you would ask MR simulator to give you one of the methods. So let's say you just want to block decay spectrum. So you import the block decay spectrum and then you create that object by just you know, defining, you know, putting in the arguments here, which are fairly obvious, you know, that you want to have a channel with carbon 13, what the field strength is, you're spinning at three kilohertz, and what your, your spectral dimension is. And that creates a method object. Then you create, you pull in the simulator object, you instantiate a simulator, you feed it the spin system, you feed it the list of methods, the list of spin systems, and you run. And that's it. That's how you run the app. And, and that's all you had to do to set up and run that particular example. Now, generally speaking, you might want to do some post simulation signal processing. Maybe you want to apply line broadening. So we have a, an object that's a signal processor object that you can bring in and you can create a list of operations that you might want to do. And then you create the object and then you just apply it to the simulation that's attached to the method and you're done. And that's in one sheet there, you can see all the script you would need to do that simple example of a, a carbon 13 attached to a proton spinning at three kilohertz. And then with Python, the cool thing is that you can leverage all of these pre-existing packages. So for example, matplotlib is a Python library. It can create very versatile, different types of, of visualizations. And so in this particular case, you just pull in matplotlib and you grab the spectrum from the um, from the uh, process data there, and then you can plot it. I even added a little line here where it says you can save that as a file, as a PDF. You can open that in Illustrator, edit it up, and then you can put it in your manuscript or presentation, which is what I did here. So that's really it. So let me give you a few more examples just to show you some more aspects about how it works. So a spin system object is just a collection of site and coupling objects. So if I have something like everybody's favorite molecule, ethanol, and I want to create the proton spectrum for that, well, then I would create a site for the methyl protons, put in the parameters, a site for the methylene protons, and a site for the hydroxyl proton. And I have created my sites, and I put my sites into a list. So I have you know, three methyl protons, two methylene protons, one hydroxyl proton, and now I have my sites list defined. Then I create couplings between those. So between zero and three, between zero and four, I have a J coupling between one and three and one and four, I have a J couplings and so on. I create all of those couplings, put those into a, a list. And then I create the spin system with the list of sites, the list of couplings. And notice here, I'm putting in an abundance. So in this case, you know, if you know, you've done uh, NMR on proton NMR on ethanol, you know that there are isotopomers that will be present where, the, where some of these carbons might not be C12, but they might be C13. So with C13 here, the abundance of that particular isotopomer is 97.812. And if I wanted to add those other isotopomers, I could like this one here or this one here, I could then go ahead and create a carbon 13 site, add it to the list of sites. I have my couplings here between carbon 13 and those protons. I can put those here create, add those to the list of couplings and then create another spin system, which I'll call isotopomer two with all of the sites and couplings and its particular abundance. And then likewise, I can do it with this other isotopomer with the carbon here. And here you see the same code, pretty much identical. I create my simulator object. And I add my, put my isotopomers together in my, in my spin system. And then I can go on and finish that simulation as I did before. So here's the result that you would get from that simulation. Here you see 
nice proton spectrum here, and you can see the little carbon-13 satellites down here with the right abundance. And also the carbon-13 spectrum could be simulated by just creating a second method to do the C13 spectrum. So that's pretty straightforward. Most of the stuff on the spin system, I think, is probably pretty obvious. If you've done any of these previous codes, you know, that makes pretty good sense. The method object is where I, I think that, you know, the power of this uh, package comes in. So in a method object, we'll hold a collection of spectral dimension objects. And each spectral dimension object will describe a dimension in a multidimensional spectrum. So if you have a 1D spectrum, you just need one spectral dimension object. If you have a 5D spectrum, you're going to have five spectral dimension objects in it. And inside each of these spectral dimension objects, you're going to create a sequence of events. And inside each of these events, you can do a number of things. So for example, you can create, you can select among a list of possible frequency contributions. You could change the rotor speed, the rotor angle, the magnetic field. You can select transitions based on their P or D symmetry as defined here. You could modulate the transition amplitude with say a constant duration event, for example, a one over four J period. You might want to do a pulse like a pi over two or a pi pulse to transfer you from one transition to another. Uh, or you might want to calculate the spectrum with, uh, you know, with, with all the amplitudes and frequencies from all these prior events to create one spectral event, which then might be part of another, which might have an, a later spectral event, which all makes the total spectral dimension. So the, the idea was to sort of build all this versatility in so that you can create a spectral dimension to hold whatever kind of spectrum you can dream up within the constraints of what we can do with MR simulator, which is again, sort of limited to looking at uh, Zeeman eigenstate kind of problems. So here's a, a, a sort of classic example here where say you wanted to create methods for a uh, Han echo on spin one or a solid echo on spin one. So a Han echo experiment is just pi over two and a pi pulse. And that actually creates a series of transition pathways. So for example, up to this transition then here, and then also to this transition in here, which have the following P and D symmetries associated with them. This, what this, what this particular pathway or this sequence does is it generates a Han echo that refocuses the chemical shift but the quadrupolar splitting is refocused by this. And so this would actually, this echo top would be modulated by the quadrupolar splitting, but, but the chemical shift would be gone. Whereas the solid echo is a pi over two, pi over two pulse, and it selects a pathway of minus one, minus one. So the chemical shift is modulating the echo, whereas the quadrupole is being refocused. So the echo tops here, if you were just doing a, a 1D spectrum from the echo tops, one would have the quadrupole splitting modulating it. The other one would have the chemical shift modulating it. So how would you do that in MR simulator? Well, you would create a method. You can define the channels in the field, some obvious things to count the spectral width. And then you would say, I have a series of events. I have a spectral event here during this period. It's a fraction of the time is 0.5. And I want to select a coherence of P of one. Then I have a mixing event where I put in a pi pulse to do to mix my transitions. And then I have another spectral event, 0.5 is the, the fraction. And then I select the other, uh, the P of minus one here, and that's the method. So I've just written the Han equal echo sequence here that will be useful for a deuterium channel. Solid echo looks pretty much exactly the same here. The only difference is here now I'm selecting P of minus one and P of minus one for these two periods. And now I'm using a pi over two pulse for my mixing event. And so putting these two methods together with the spin system, which is deuterium. So I put in the spin system, I put in both methods, I run the simulator and it outputs out both of these spectrum. This is the, what you get from the modulation of the echo tops of the Han echo. This is the modulation of the echo tops from the solid echo. And we get the quad splitting pattern and the CSA pattern on the solid echo. So it's that straightforward. So we've built in a number of different methods, pre-built methods that you might want to use here. But again, uh, you could you could generate your own. We've also built some sort of uh, generic one and two D methods to, to save you from a, typing in a few lines of code. You can just specify a few little details here, and I'll give you some examples as I go on here. So one of those examples here is this uh, spinning sideband method. So you can imagine two D pass or or mat 
uh, experiment. So this is an example where we simulate on a quadrupole uh, a QMAT experiment with PA tie acquisition. This was done by Brendan Walder, my group back in 2020, 2013. And here is the method. So we just say, we pull in that method. We define the parameters as you might expect. It's got two spectral dimensions because it's a two dimensional experiment. So here's the first spectral dimension defined. Here's the spect second spectral dimension. And because this experiment is predefined, it already knows that this dimension is the anisotropy dimension and this one's the infinite speed dimension. So we just have to specify a few parameters. And here you see, here's the experiment that, that Bren Brennan did. And here's the simulation of that experiment from MR simulator that only took 30 milliseconds in MR simulator. Here's another experiment I think is really cool. This was done by Jay Shore back in Berkeley using a DAS probe, uh, but he just switching between 30, I think it was uh, 70.12 and the magic angle. And this is on rubidium perchromate. And so what you're doing is you're just correlating the central transition spectrum between those two angles. And you get these really beautiful powder patterns, uh, 2D powder patterns. And actually, if you analyze these spectra, you could work out the principal components of the EFG and the CSA tensor and the relative orientation between them. But it's, a, it's actually a pretty challenging calculation if you were trying to use some of those other apps to try to you know, simulate this because it's a lot of crystallite orientations that you have to bend over 2D. But you can see in, uh, in MR simulator, we just use the generic 2D method approach. And then we just simply have to define an event where we set one of the rotor angles to 70 degrees. We select P of minus one and D of zero to get the central transition. And then for the second uh, dimension, we define an event where we have the magic angle for the rotor angle, and we define uh, a transition query with P of minus one and D of zero for again, the central transition. And that simulation, 40 milliseconds, you can get that really cool looking spectrum that Jay Shore got back in 96. Okay. There are many other examples in the library. Uh, if you go to the read the docs page, you can scroll through and you can see various scripts where you can, you can try to work through these and see how we simulate all kinds of uh, 1D examples. There's a number of 2D examples in there too. Uh, just to give you some benchmarks on how well this works, the code is actually written in Python, but it's got a core part that's written in C and it's wrapped in Python. So that sort of gives us the sort of speed advantage. So for example, if you take this central transition of a half integer quadrupole nuclei at a finite speed, this is actually a good test because you got you know, uh, spinning sidebands, you got anisotropy, all that's thrown in there. In MR simulator, this takes about 7.2 milliseconds. Now, if you were doing this in Simpson and you were doing this in the time domain, well, then you're doing this for every crystallite and you're doing the, one, you're doing the acquisition with the spinning, that takes about 20.5 seconds. Now, to be fair, Simpson has a really cool feature added with working with Matthias uh, Eden and, and Tomas Kozegard using these fast Wigner transforms. They can actually do simulations directly in the frequency domain for things like this. And actually in that case, they get about 30.5 milliseconds. But you can see that MR simulator still does pretty well. It's about four times faster than, uh, than Simpson. Uh, S-Snake was another uh, Python package that's, it was released recently. Uh, they we tried it out on there, but it actually takes about 789 seconds, but it turns out that it looks like they're not using Alderman Grant, which is probably something they need to look into to improve their efficiency for that simulation. So the general strategy then is by building this Python package, we can connect to all kinds of other packages that live in this Python universe. And as you know, there's lots of different things like particularly like scikit-learn or Plotly. Uh, we've written some other ones ourselves, uh, one called uh, CSDM and, and MR inversion. Uh, LM fit is another really important one if you're going to do any kind of least squares fitting. And so I'm going to show you some examples of how we integrate um, uh, MR simulator with some of these other packages. So obviously the first one you might want to do is LM fit, which is a, a really powerful package in Python for doing least squares fitting. All you need to do is hook up MR simulator to it, and you can start fitting all of your experimental spectrum uh, with the, the combination of the two. So here is an example of how that might look. I'll run through this to show you. So first of all, what you're gonna do is you're gonna import your experimental data set into the, your Python uh, script or notebook. And then you're gonna define the, the standard deviation for the noise. 
we're going to work with the real part of the experiment and we're going to convert it to ppm so that little section there is just bringing in the data getting it into the right units for doing the simulation then from the we're going to we put together some utility functions to help you get set up for your experiment so from the uh experimental data set you can get the spectral dimensions that we're going to need for our method object later then we go into the code that looks pretty similar to what we've seen before so we're going to create our site object that you know and then we're going to create our spin uh system object from the site object then we're going to create our uh, uh method object in this case silicon 29 with a very slow rotor speed of 780 we're going to pull in the spectral dimension from the experiment and then we're going to also attach the experiment to the method so the method will hold the simulation and it will also hold the experiment that it's trying to simulate then we create the simulator object as before we run we create our processor object we put in a little bit of line broadening and that is setting up the simulation that we need to do the fit of the spectrum so the next step then is we have another uh, utility object that will then create all the parameters from the simulator and the processor that we need in LM fit. And then we simply import LM fit. We feed it our least squares function that we predefined. It, it's another utility function. The parameters we just extracted and the arguments that it needs, basically the simulator, the, the signal processor and the noise and you run and you've now fit that spectrum. And you can actually, what's cool about this is that you can fit simultaneous spectra with different methods methods for a single set of spin system parameters because LM fit has all of these kind of nice capabilities built into it. And so we also have on the website uh, examples of fitting different types of spectra. So if you have a case that's there, you can just follow along. If you don't have the case there, write a script, send it to us. Maybe we'll add it to the example list. Uh, another cool thing that we've done is we've added uh, uh, taking MR simulator, we've created a package called MR inversion and in using scikit-learn create this package that we, allows us to do a linear inversion of a 2D spectrum. For example, 2D mat or 2D pass where we correlate isotropic to anisotropic back to the distribution of tensor parameters that led to that spectrum. And this is done entirely model free. And so I, I gave a talk actually on this at the ACS meeting, and there's some videos online. You can find it. And also, DuPont gave a talk at the Global NMR discussion group. You can find a nice talk on this. But this is a really powerful use of, you know, of MR Simulator and Scikit-Learn to create this MR inversion package. And this allows us to do this model-free inversion. And for the glass work that we're doing, this is really going to be a game changer for us to do this without having to build models of what the tensor distributions are like. And then the other cool thing uh, uh, is that you can actually build uh, web apps from your Python packages. And any of you have probably looked at um, uh, COVID dashboards, you know, apps like I think Alexi Zershop has written a really cool uh, Python app using Plotly and Dash also, maybe you know about it. Uh, but we've done a Plotly Dash app that uses MR Simulator. So even if you don't know, Python, and you don't want to learn about MR Simulator and, and LM Fit, you'll be able to go to the uh, the web app that we built from this and upload your experimental data set, select the method, set, enter, you know, build your spin system, and and do a fit to your spectrum this way. So that's another cool feature that you get by just sort of you know, it's uh, the cool thing is that you have all of these different packages that just exist, and you can build something so quickly. Uh, because of all the community of the developers that are that are working here. So we just needed to build our core app here for magnetic resonance. Now, one last thing here before I finish is that one of the things that we ran into, one of the problems that we ran into is that we needed to work with 1D, 2D, 3D data sets. And we had a problem that we didn't really have a file format or a serialization that was that would was uh, useful enough that would would work for all the types of examples that we're looking at, and we knew, for example, like JCamp is something that was has been developed, you know, back in the really 80s and 90s, but it really isn't working with the modern computer paradigm, the software paradigms that are around today. So, working with Tomas Bozegard and Dominic Massio, 
we developed a very lightweight uh, data set model. We call it the core scientific data set model. And you can serialize this in JSON, you can serialize it in YAML, you can serialize in any format you'd like, but the model is really powerful in that it allows you and with a very small number of metadata to be able to describe a whole different range of data set types. And so actually, you know, I sent this abstract into panic and they rejected it because I didn't have the word NMR in it. And the reason we didn't have, I didn't have NMR in the abstract because the data, the data model is so general, it can, you can use it for any type of, of, of uh, da scientific data set that you're working with, whether you're doing microscopy or vectors or you know, diffusion tensor imaging. So it's, it's, you could use it for all types of spectroscopy and other types of data set. And that's what's great is that you can then bring all that data sets together in one common format and be able to view them all together without having to have translators for the different file formats. So that was been developed uh, by that team. And uh, we've also developed a Python library to support that, but I'll also let you know that, that uh, CSDM is supported also by DMFIT. You can actually export in Simpson. It's the native format for easy NMR. Uh, my, my app, RMN uses it. And recently, NMR Glue, we've updated NMR Glue, so NMR Glue can now export as CSDM. So I think that sort of summarizes what I wanted to tell you about. And I'm just gonna summarize here with this last slide to show you that it's, it's very straightforward to get MR simulator, simply pip install at a terminal uh, or in your notebook. You can look at the documentation. We have probably about four or 500 pages worth of documentation and examples particularly that you can look at for how to use it. And if you'd like to, uh, take a look at the code. We're looking for other Python savvy programmers who would join us in the project and, and help us make this a real community effort. You know, learn about GitHub workflows and try to sort of become participants in this so that we, we don't do these as sort of isolated units anymore, that we do this as a community. And with that, I'll thank you and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions for Phil about his fancy new program. I think there are two of them here already. Uh, oh, there was one. Open just a second. Uh, <clears throat> what methods do you use to calculate your propagators, particularly exponential <clears throat> of a matrix? Uh, <clears throat> and says, thanks for such a nice uh, and useful open so source software. Well, the, the thing is, we, we don't use propagators in, in that sense. We know that we're not doing any exponentiated matrix. We have analytical expressions for the NMR transition frequencies. So we're using those analytical expressions to get us that speed. So no matrices have been harmed in the process of any of these simulations. So we don't need to do that. Yeah. It's all analytical. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> have you done any so, so we've been interested in, in simulating uh, 017, 2D, and three, three quantum mass experiments. Have you done any of that? A absolutely, yeah. That be empty mass for you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Should probably be trivial for you almost. It's absolutely, yeah. It's absolutely trivial. It's just a few milliseconds to calculate an MQ mass spectrum uh, of 017. We've actually got you know three Q. We actually put a seven Q in there, but you know it's, you need a lot of power for that. So, but those are very straightforward. It's a pre-built methods actually for MQ mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And this is all at grandinetti.org slash software. So you can pick up everything. Well, I have a list of all the different packages there, but yeah, uh, but you can, you can definitely find it uh, at these various places. You can go to the read the docs, or you can go to GitHub and find it. Uh, and again, if anyone, you know, if you decide to use this and you're, and you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're more than happy to help get more people on board and, and, uh, and try to help make sure that you can do your kind of simulations. Okay. All right. Uh, there's another question here from Jeff. Uh, he says, gorgeous. And what about hyperfine interactions with our favorite electrons? Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's not possible, uh, and but I haven't really we haven't really 
you know, maybe in a later version, we can, we can entertain that. Or maybe even better, you know, somebody in your lab might want to become a participant in the project and, and try to figure out what we need to add those kind of capabilities. Yeah. And I mean, there are DNP experiments you could try to add to your, to your system too. Yeah, I mean, perhaps. I mean, I think that, you know, the main advantage to DMP is that it just gives you the enhancement and then everything else is you simulate, right? Uh, I mean, in terms of the spin physics of DMP, I think probably you might you might be better off with some of the other uh, more elaborate codes. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, Jeffrey has a question. How do you implement phase cycling? Well, phase cycling, well, in a sense, it's pathway selection, right? So, uh, and that's where we have these, what we call transition queries, where you can use different transition symmetries to select uh, select the, the pathway. So, and that's something similar it's done, you know, in, in Simpson and, and the other apps too, where you just, you know, you don't actually run the phase, you just actually select the pathway. So I think uh, in that example here, you can see that in this experiment here, my pathway is plus one and minus one for the Han echo and then minus one, minus one. So I just have a transition query where I say, I want to have only transitions with P of one. And then in the second part, P of minus one. But whereas in this experiment, I say, I want transitions with only P of minus one during the first part and P of minus one during the second spectral event. Okay, so, uh... Can you control how fine the powder integrals? Absolutely, you can actually. That's one of the behind under underneath the hood things. But you can control the the. It's actually we're just sort of using Alderman and Grant, so you can just control the the size of the uh, of the integration grid that we're using. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions for Phil. Uh, maybe I just ask a quick question. Uh, yeah, Bob, if you remember, like in the past, we were trying to do something on the ox simulating like uh, with a killer double, like incorporating dynamics for oxygen 17 nuclei. So, Phil, can you incorporate dynamics in your code? I, I won't say no. It's just not something that we're, we're, we've been doing. Uh, but I mean, you, I mean you, you could do it. There are various ways and you could do that. And uh, uh, again, you don't necessarily need, you know, I mean, you, one way of sort of thinking about this is you're, you're really, we're looking at, you know, all the transitions uh, and, and then you can sort of jump from transition to transition to transition. So you, you could, you could in, implement some type of, of uh, dynamics in, in maybe some of the events, but I haven't really I haven't really thought too much about that. We, we could discuss that. I'll bring it up with the team. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, I, would, I won't say no. Yeah, I, I've, I've done that personally before. Like, yeah, I mean, the, the framework that I was, I, you have, I have to promote it from a Hubert space to a Lugolin space and then jumping right. between different configurations. <laughs> and it becomes very computationally expensive. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our goal, our goal here really was to get speed, right? Because, you know, for example, for us, we're simulating glasses. And if we want to do uh, a distribution that's present in the glass, we, we may need 100,000 powder patterns to make a glass specter. And so that's where you really need the speed. If you're going to, particularly if you're going to be doing a, a 2D glass spectrum and you need 100,000 or, or more uh, you know, powder patterns to do a, a spectrum correctly, and then you're doing a fitting or an inversion or something like that, then you need speed to do that. And that's why we, we wanted to focus on, you know, we, we'd rather have speed than versatility, but we wanted to try to get as much versatility as we could in without compromising the speed. I, I assume like your program is also like compatible with, you know, using like a uh, cluster GPU. Uh, yeah, it does take advantage of, of multiple processors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So if there are <clears throat> no further questions, why don't we, uh, I want to thank both of our speakers today for some very stimulating talks, uh, very different topics. Christian on his uh, NV diamonds, detecting EPR and NMR, and Phil for a really uh, 
nice introduction to this new simulation software, all right? And Kong, next week, two weeks from now, we will be back on the air um, with a uh, another couple of speakers. And do you have the list uh, available to announce today? Huh? Sure, sure, sure. We have the list available like until the end of the year. So in two, uh, two weeks later, we will be hosting uh, Joseph Lewandowski and then and, uh, and Nino Vili from ETH, from Jessica Group. So, okay. yeah. so an EPR and an NMR talk two weeks from today. DMP, how's DMP. DMP? Okay, how's DMP, all right. Exactly. Okay, so Christian, again, thank you very much. And Phil, thank you very much for a really uh, inspiring talk. All right. Thanks, thanks again. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.